Hey, babe. She's a scheming seductress. She knew how to flirt. She knew how to interact with men. Men are just pawns in Nancy Siegel's high-stakes game. Yes. Their money fuels her obsession. He had nothing left by the time she was finished with him. And drives her to the darkest ends. It's really horrifying. How could you do that to a man, to a person? Atlantic City, New Jersey, 1998. Posh boardwalk hotels offer the ultimate getaway from the real world. High stakes gambler Nancy Siegel and her new beau, Tony Smith, are escaping into another night of pure self indulgence. She liked the finer things in life. And for her, Atlantic City was a place to go when times were good and you had some money to spend. Hey, babe. Oh, sweetheart. You look fantastic. Thank you. Tony treats Nancy like a queen. He provided a very nice uh, living for her, and they enjoyed the fruits of that kind of living. Let's go get some dinner, huh? Yes. And after that? Gambling. Oh, yeah. I want to spend you? all your money. <laughs> yeah, right. He was very good to her, and she had whatever she wanted from him. To winning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she looked like she was living the life. Oh, yes, yes all right. <laughs> it's a far cry from her life early on. Nancy grows up in Fells Point, a gritty, working-class neighborhood nestled in the city's waterfront. While Nancy's still a child, her mother and only sibling, a younger sister, move away, leaving her to be raised by her father. Hi, Dad. Hey, Nancy, where have you been? I was just at Amy's house. Her father was in the picture up through her teen years, and I know Nancy adored her father. I gotta go work another double shift tonight. So I gotta get going, okay? She may not have gotten to spend enough time with him. He spent a lot of his time working, trying to support her. See me again in the morning. He also spends his time supporting a gambling habit. <laughs> Nancy's father takes her to the track, where she learns all about winning, losing, and the rush that goes along with it. There's a high to spending that money. There's this thrill that you may get a return, you may get something back. But there are rumors that her father is losing more than he's winning. How you doing, buddy? And in 1964, when Nancy is only 16 years old, her father is attacked while walking home. <laughs> and beaten to death. Nancy is inconsolable. Nancy was severely hurt by the loss, which remained through her as an adult. The pain eases when she falls in love and marries entrepreneur Charles Kucharski, who is hopelessly devoted to her. It was a happy marriage, and they seemed perfect for each other. Soon, the happy bride is the devoted mother of two. She and her husband have two daughters. She devotes her time to raising them, and things go quite well for many years. But Nancy has a secret. While her husband is at work, and the kids are at school. She's gambling in local casinos. I don't know if she was just tired of playing mother and wife, or she just at some point begins 
checking out gambling. Pretty soon, Nancy is spending more and more time and money at the casinos. I think underneath it was controlling her more than she was controlling it. Whatever she did win, it seems that she reinvested that back into gambling and eventually wound up on the losing end. As the song goes, you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. But Nancy never seems to walk away. Instead, she raises the stakes. She begins the opening lines of credit in her husband's name. She relatively quickly racks up tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Nancy intercepts the mail every day, so her husband never sees the bills. But the jig is up when the IRS comes calling. There, in fact, were uh, records that were uh, delivered reflecting uh, an IRS attempt to collect uh, taxes on gambling earnings. Her husband soon discovers that he's $100,000 in the hole between Nancy's unpaid taxes and gambling debts. He is forced to declare bankruptcy. Charles never presses charges, but the couple soon files for divorce. He did nothing about it. He didn't go to authorities. Now cut off from her husband's accounts, Nancy needs to find a wealthy admirer to fund her expensive habit. She was willing to take anyone down to keep being able to gamble. Now divorced and without the funds to finance her secret gambling habit, Nancy Siegel is forced to support herself. She reluctantly applies her charms as a saleswoman. She was selling burial plots, mausoleums, door to door. And that's when she meets wow. Jack Watkins. It's beautiful. Jack Watkins was an elderly man who had lost his wife. Let me give you my card. You look great for, what is it, 55? She knew how to flirt. She knew how to uh, interact with men. She had a way about her that drew people to her. Now let me show you one in particular that I think would be a great fit. You see this one here? Somehow, just in that odd scenario situation, she got his attention. Nancy convinces Jack to buy a burial plot. Maybe we can meet again sometime. Sure. I'd love that. But she has her eye on an even bigger prize. That's my personal number right there. She somehow sold herself enough to Jack Watkins that he wanted her to be a part of his life. Jack falls hard and fast for Nancy. Nancy became Jack's world. She was all consuming to him. Oh, baby. And Jack's friends grow concerned when the love-struck widower asks Nancy to marry him after only several months of dating. I think everyone was concerned because these people weren't intuitively uh, a, a match made in heaven. They were decades apart in terms of their age and quite different in terms of their lifestyle. Now that she's stolen Jack's heart, it's time to steal his money. She opened accounts in his name, and she directed that the mail come to her, and he didn't know about it. She quickly maxes out his credit cards. But most of Jack's money goes to her greatest love, gambling. She loses more and more. More than $100,000 of Jack Watkins' money was just gone. Blinded by love, Jack fails to notice another devious deception. Hello? Nancy is systematically cutting him off from friends and family. I'm sorry, Jack's not home right now. Nancy would intercept Jack's phone messages and never, never pass them along. Have a good day. Bye. Was that oh, for me? You scared me. Hmm. Oh, no, that was just a courtesy call. Okay. Well, I'm off. Okay, okay. sweetie. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. She also deletes his voicemails. 
Jack, Molly, give me a call. And after a while, this keeps happening again and again. The calls just stopped coming in, and eventually Jack was on his own with Nancy. With no one looking out for Jack, Nancy continues to feed her addiction by bleeding him dry. Black fool. And on a romantic getaway in Atlantic City, at least that's what Jack thinks, Nancy drains the last of his bank account. He had nothing left by the time that she was finished with him in just about 18 months. Which means it's time for Nancy to move on. As a result, she had to do something with Jack. Lucky for Nancy, hard-drinking Jack is sowing the seeds of his own demise. I really not feel it, dude. He drank heavily while he was in Atlantic City. Jack? Jack? Can Sir. someone help me? Sir. Security! The Atlantic City bender sends Jack over the edge. He collapses due to severe intoxication and ends up in the hospital, where he tells doctors his fiance will take care of him. Could I speak to you for a moment, please? Sure. But Nancy tells the doctor a very different story. What exactly brought you here today? Well, um, Jack seems to be getting progressively worse. He seems confused. Well, he says that you're his fiance. No, I'm, I'm actually his caretaker. When they asked if she was romantically involved, she said, absolutely not. Poor thing, he's so confused lately. Sometimes he thinks I'm his daughter, sometimes his fiance, sometimes his wife. Have you cared for him for long? You can just imagine it almost. He's saying, I love her, she loves me, we're gonna get married. And just behind him, Nancy's going, crazy. Yeah, happy to help however I can. And they believed her. We're going to have to move him to a psychiatric ward. You know, I think that makes sense. For Nancy, this was perfect because she got rid of Jack. She didn't have to take care of him. It looks like Nancy has gotten away with it again. Really appreciate it, doctor. Thank you. With Jack out of the picture, Nancy needs to move on to her next target. Hey. It's Nancy. How have you been? A wealthy commercial loan broker named Tony Smith. So when can I see you? But before Nancy can put all of her energy into Tony and his money, she runs into a problem. Can you hold on a second? Hello? Hi, this is the hospital calling about Jack Watkins. Uh, we're going to need you to come pick him up. Doctors tell Nancy they don't have room for Jack. She needs to find another long-term care option. I'm gonna have to call you back. Thank you. This was just a horrible turn of events for Nancy because now she's got someone who's gonna definitely be in the way. So she really had to get rid of Jack. This time, Nancy goes further than she's ever gone before. She brings Jack home. Oh, sweet. Okay. It's time to take your pill. There we go. And begins plying him with powerful sedatives. So day by day, Jack is getting weaker. This woman that he loved and that had promised him the world was killing him. In such a weakened state, Jack can do little to stop his cruel caretaker. Jack, can you lay down? Nancy couldn't have that. Lay down, Jack. 
With her patient still clinging to life, Nancy decides to take Jack. matters into her own hands. Lay down. Nancy could have released the pressure and Jack would have lived. But she didn't. To avoid inviting unwanted questions, Nancy doesn't call the police. Instead, she stuffs the corpse in a large trunk and hauls it away. And you just think of his body in that trunk while she goes down the stairs. Kathunk. Kathunk. It's really horrifying. Nancy callously leaves the body 70 miles away in a Virginia parking lot, where police find it just hours later. There were no identifying documents. They ran the fingerprints of his. Since he had no criminal record, it didn't show up. Police label Jack's corpse as a John Doe. His identity remains a mystery for seven years. No one comes to look for Jack because Nancy has alienated him from all of his loved ones. During that time, Nancy doesn't look back. In 1998, she marries Tony and, like Jack before, begins draining his bank account. She ultimately defrauds him of between $200,000 and $300,000. But Tony's money isn't enough. Nancy needs more. Nancy Siegel had completely liquidated Jack's assets. But what she hadn't liquidated was his income. Since no one knows Jack Watkins is dead, he continues receiving Social Security checks, and Nancy Siegel is cashing them. The level of sort of premeditation for what she did is really quite staggering. It's breathtaking. For seven years, gambling junkie Nancy Siegel has gotten away with the murder of her elderly lover, Jack Watkins. That's because, for those seven years, police have been unable to identify his remains. All that's about to change. A match to Jack's fingerprints suddenly appears in a police database. The Department of Defense merged their fingerprint files, he was a veteran, with the FBI files, and they got a hit. Detectives finally have a name to work with. And that's when they then checked the records of Social Security and found that his checks were being cashed over the last seven years that he had been a John Doe. Detectives easily find out where the checks are going and who is cashing them. And the trail leads them right to Nancy Siegel. Can I help you? Nancy Siegel? Yes. My name is Detective Ross. This is Detective Madison. We'd like to ask you a few questions. OK. Do you know this gentleman? Yeah, it's Jack Watkins. Why? Nancy Siegel thought she could con her way out of the interview. Do you know where he is? Yeah, he's in Pennsylvania. <laughs> See, the thing is, Mrs. Siegel, he's dead. What? How did this happen? We were hoping you could tell us. I don't know what you're talking about, really. You're gonna have to come downtown and answer a few more questions. She was in a panic at that point. I don't know anything about this. The interviewer sort of pressed her a little harder and told her that they knew exactly where Jack was and exactly what she had done. Nancy is arrested and charged with fraud and murder. She goes to trial. And in 2009, Nancy Siegel is convicted of murdering Jack Watkins. The judge sentences her to 33 years in federal prison. He noted that at her age, a sentence of 33 years was quite likely a life sentence, that she would 
never rejoin society and that there was justice in that. And I think Judge Davis was exactly right. Nancy will have plenty of time to contemplate how greed and gambling destroyed the lives of everyone around her. Most of all, Jack Watkins. This was a woman who was literally willing to do anything for that rush of gambling that led her ultimately to kill Jack Watkins so that her crimes against him could be silenced forever with him. And she very, very nearly succeeded.